Well, welcome all. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here this morning. Let's begin with prayer. Good way to start. Our Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for this special day of the week, the Lord's Day, this uh, time when you deign to meet with us as we gather in your name in this place. We do thank you for the opportunity for fellowship this morning, and we thank you for the opportunity for worship. And we pray, Lord, that all that transpires in these walls will bring honor and glory to your name. We uh, thank you, Lord, for this, uh, the inauguration of this class, and we pray that you will use it, Lord, to give us a sense of your uh, sovereign power and control over all of history, and that uh, we might uh, see uh, what is our heritage uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the church. We might glory in that and seek to be even more faithful. So come by your spirit now and uh, teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. This is the fourth, and I think it'll be the final installment of uh, our Lenten focus on Puritanism. We started in, uh, during Lent in 2019, uh, and we focused on six-week study on John Owen, Puritanism's great uh, theologian. Uh, and then in uh, 2020, uh, our uh, focus was on John Bunyan, uh, Puritanism's great uh, author, writer, and, and preacher for sure. Um, and then last year, our focus was on Richard Baxter, who wrote The Reformed Pastor. Um, and uh, now we're going to bring Puritanism across the pond, and we're going to focus on uh, the rise of American, American Puritanism. Puritanism, as defined in one of the great, great works, real accessible works on the history of Puritanism was written by, by James I. Packer. Uh, Packer defined Puritanism as, quote, a movement for church reform, pastoral renewal, evangelism, and spiritual revival that took place in England between basically 1560 and 1660. So that's the time frame that we are, that we're looking at here. So <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, take a, a running start uh, at this and do a bit of a review of Puritan history prior to it coming over to America. Uh, because this just isn't something that just kind of uh, spontaneously combusted here. <laughs> you know, in, uh, in Danvers, Massachusetts, or something like that. Um, this is uh, something that is, in fact, a long-term work uh, of God. So we're going to uh, deal with some of the, review some of the history today, prior to the crossover. Um, and then, starting uh, the next week, we'll look at the history of the pilgrims, which are, who are not to be confused with the Puritans. The pilgrims and the Puritans were two different groups of people. Although, um, make sure that I'm, I'm straight on this, all pilgrims were Puritans, but not all Puritans were pilgrims, okay? Uh, so you've got a group of individuals who um, go to Plymouth, and then another group of individuals who are, um, who are populating the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, and we'll, we'll deal with all that in the next couple, of, uh, next couple of weeks. Then we'll deal with some Puritan practices. And um, so that's, that's the approach that we're, that we're going to take. So I, I just want to kind of underscore some things, uh, make some comments on this uh, outline. Uh, much of which uh, those of you who have been in this class over the last four years have seen before. Uh, but I think it's just a good thing to have 
on uh, a good thing to have on hand. Um, The last class I taught, Chris, you asked me a question that I didn't. Did I ever answer your question? Okay. What was that, a year ago? Oh, that's right. I sent you an email. Okay. Oh, my gosh. This is the last class, Tom. <laughs> Definitely losing it. Okay. So, a very brief outline is right up, in the, right up at this top section here. Puritanism is the continuation of God's spirit setting the church right through reformation, revival, and renewal. It is God's providential arrangement of history, nations, kings, the church, men of faith, and historical context. That's my definition, though uh, Packer's is much more elegant and shorter, of course. Um, if you look down three lines, the 16th century, that's the... That's the, the period of the, of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, but um, really where this begins uh, is in the 14th century with John Wycliffe. You are familiar with the name Wycliffe Bible Translators. Goes, you know, it's a reference to, uh, to John Wycliffe and the Lollards. And then uh, Tyndale as well. Then we have Luther, Calvin, and the Protestant Reformation that takes place over on the continent. And then the writings of Luther, in particular, make their way over into England through Cambridge University. And then Cambridge University dons, teachers, professors, they are turning out the nation's pastors, and these pastors are going out into uh, churches, um, and they are promoting um, Reformation ideas. And um, so then this becomes the beginning of the, uh, the English Reformation, um, and after a period of about 100 years or so, some of the individuals involved in the English Reformation then make their way to um, the New World, some through England uh, or from England, and some from Holland. And we'll explain how that all works in the next uh, in the next two weeks. So there's the uh, uh, there's there's the flow of it, and the. Uh, in fact, I, I, I do remember now that uh, there was a, let's not say a misprint, let's say a misstatement on my part in the description that you've seen in the bulletin the last couple of weeks about this class. There's a reference to Puritanism as an 18th century phenomenon. That's wrong. It's a 17th century. Uh, and I can't remember whether I was just, um, well, I was just out of it, I'm sure. Uh, that I, I sent that uh, I sent that description to uh, to, didn't catch to me. It. and Tom, my editor didn't catch it. So let's just say it's Tom's fault. I feel more comfortable. With. So that's where we've been. That's kind of where where we're going. Um, so American uh, Puritanism uh, um, flows from the 1600s into the 1700s as well, and then into um, what uh, you perhaps are uh, familiar with as the First Great Awakening. I suppose, um, you know, if there's a time slot next spring, I'm not necessarily uh, uh, lobbying for this, Tom, but uh, uh, if there's a time slot, we could move uh, in this flow into the first and second great awakenings in America because they just keep, they, they, follow, they follow right along. And as the outline indicates here, the rise of evangelicalism. So um, those are just some very, very broad strokes, some, uh, some broad rubrics. Okay. The rise of Puritanism is part of the story of the English Reformation, which is a continuation of the Continental Reformation, the Reformation on the continent, okay? So that which took place in Germany, uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva, uh, 
other places as well. And it has uh, sort of its uh, seeds in John Wycliffe. So you see the dates for Wycliffe um, in the 14th century. You can see he, uh, he was a, a teacher at Oxford. He was a great critic uh, of the privilege and pomp and circumstance of the clergy. Now remember, this is pre-Reformation. So it's not like he's criticizing the Catholic Church from outside. There is no other church. Um, strictly speaking, there is another church. There's the eastern part of the church as well that goes back to the Great Schism in, uh, in the 12th century. But, um, so he's within, he's within the church, the only Christian church uh, there is. But there is a great... Um, great abuses on the part of the clergy. Uh, they'd gotten very, very uh, wealthy, a lot of land given, a lot of gifts given to clergy for special favors done because the church had so much, so much power. Wycliffe's contribution, however, is a translation of the Bible from the Latin, the Vulgate, which was the, the Bible that was used uh, in the church, into English, and so it gets the Bible into the language of the people. This whole movement of God, starting back with the 14th century, uh, the 14th century, but really from the very beginning, uh, is a story of the power of the Word of God to transform people's lives and to transform history. So you can go back to uh, John Wycliffe in the 14th century, or you can go back to that time that's referred to when uh, the book says, in the beginning was the Word. <laughs> the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Um, God is a God of His Word, spoken and acted incarnate. But, uh, as this is the problem with writing history, of course, and teaching history, where do you start? So uh, we just uh, drove a stake into the ground here and we're starting at, uh, at, at Wycliffe. Because he translated the Bible into English, into the language of the people then, he is oftentimes known as the morning star of the uh, English Reformation. Um, here, the first bright, first bright light uh, of what God is going to be doing uh, moving forward. He attacked the veneration of saints, transubstantiation, the papacy, and so then he was uh, kicked out of, uh, of Oxford. He had a group of individuals who followed him who were known as the Lollards, and as you read church history in this period and read the church history about, um, about Wycliffe, you'll, you'll read about the Lollards. And uh, again, a general term for being a heretic, it's a Dutch word, um, Lollen, uh, which uh, has to do with mumbling, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, just for effect, actually. Um, <coughs> Lollygaggers, right? Yeah, they're yeah, they're just worthless vagabonds. Yeah, sure, that's 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 right. Um, however, it was the clergy elite who, in response to Wycliffe's translation of the Bible, said, "The jewel of the clergy has become the toy of the laity." The Bible was the exclusive property of the, uh, of the clergy who could translate it and interpret it from Hebrew or Greek, but for the most part primarily from, from Latin. Now it's open to everyone. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the cap is off the, uh, off the bottle and the genius on the, on the way out. So this is where we can trace the, the beginning of things here. Then in, um, in the uh, 15th um, century as well, we've got Wyndham, uh, William Tyndale, and you're familiar with that name, if for no other reason than the Tyndale Publishing Company. Um, Cambridge University has a, um, has a school it's, it doesn't have the it doesn't have the full uh, recognition of a college, um, but it does have a 
it does have a school uh, called Tyndale House, and um, it's a place for independent study uh, and also a place that where individuals um, uh, study uh, in preparation for ordination in the Anglican Church. But Tyndale, again, he's a linguist. He studied at Oxford, became a tutor to children of prominent people. He translated the Bible into English, and now this is the first translation, not from the Latin, which the priests and the councils and the bishops and the pope presided over, but now from the Greek and from the Hebrew. It's also the first Bible now that can be published um, with and then um, ultimately distributed more widely. Um, it uh, was published, uh, printed uh, uh, by Gutenberg's uh, printing press, um, which had been uh, invented in 1435 uh, or so. But um, so uh, the Bible is not accessible only to the clergy. Then individuals appointed by God, first um, um, Wycliffe and then Tyndale, they translate that into the language of the people. It's the next step. And then they began to teach others. But then the text itself begins to get printed um, with Gutenberg's um, movable type um, machine. And so now then, 16,000 Old and New Testament Bibles are smuggled into England. The problem for the church at this time is that people who are reading the Bible and they're saying, well, now, wait a minute. I read this. How does that square with what the church says we should be doing or the, what the church says is right and true? And so now you have this kind of movement among the laity saying, what, 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 what's going on here? This whole idea of uh, parading around in vestments, um, the, uh, the whole idea of transubstantiation of the Lord's Supper, where in the world does it say that uh, when the host is elevated with the words, this is the body of Christ broken for you, that a miracle takes place and now we're eating the body of Christ. Where is that in the Bible? So this becomes a very, very dangerous thing to the leadership of the church because the church has got tremendous, tremendous power. They have the power of what? They hold the keys to heaven and earth. Well, if you've got a problem um, with somebody out there in the church, you just do away with them. You just you condemn them to hell, and that's it. So there's a tremendous amount. I'm sorry? They can cancel you. They can cancel you. That's right. Yeah. yeah, we think that's a new phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so by way of summary then of these two uh, first uh, sections here, a key to understanding the English Reformation is the story of the Bible through Wycliffe, Tyndale, and the impact that Erasmus had. Now, Erasmus is a, uh, is a Dutch theologian. Uh, obviously, Catholic theologian. This is pre-Reformation. -re -pre um, he kind of laid the groundwork uh, for uh, people reading Luther's writings because Erasmus, who's uh, known as the great uh, Christian humanist, Erasmus wrote a lot of practical kinds of things, like um, how to be a good Christian, <laughs> you know? Uh, and... Um, uh, so, uh, we've got Tyndale, we've got Wycliffe, we've got Erasmus, all focusing on the Word of God. We've had people here over the years visit Beverly Heights and have said, um, haven't been here very long, which is good news, I think. They haven't been here very long and say, you know, it seems like 
all you guys do is talk about the Bible, Bible, Bible. <laughs> um, and, uh, of course, one response might be, well, it is the Word of God. <laughs> um, and another is that this is our historical heritage, you know, the, uh, the focus, on, focus on God's Word. Okay, um, so there's a lot of this going on at Oxford, you know, of course, Oxford and Cambridge are the two great universities, uh, but more so at, uh, 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 at, at Cambridge. Now you've got this Bible translated, and you've got some of Calvin's writings translated, and some of Luther's uh, writings that are translated. And there begins now, particularly at the university level, at, at, at Cambridge, groups of, of students getting together and um, slipping off under the cover of darkness at night and meeting at the White Horse Inn. And they're beginning to study these things. Um, some of you may be familiar with the podcast, The White Horse, White Horse Inn. That's a reference to this group of individuals who, in Cambridge, uh, began to, began to, uh, to, to meet. Um, they met at this inn where th the uh, properties of three Cambridge colleges all kind of met so they could slip in the back door at night and slip back out again. And they're getting, to get, getting together to read the Bible, study the Bible, uh, talk about theology, talk about the church and the condition of the church. So this is, these are the precursors then to what is happening what will happen then in the English church. So now we move to, uh, to um, Henry VIII, and there's a lot you know, to be discussed about, uh, about Henry VIII. This is just sort of the uh, broad strokes. The Protestant ideas are making themselves from the continent through Cambridge University in particular, and also, and also Oxford, but primarily through Cambridge. Um, and they begin to be disseminated out throughout uh, the country. Um, you are familiar, I think, with the split between uh, the English church, um, or between England and, uh, and Rome. Uh, some of that had to do with, uh, uh, with Henry VIII's um, devotion to Reformation ideas. But a lot of it had to do with his desire to, uh, to attain uh, a divorce. And that's laid, out, uh, that's laid out here. I think the key here is 1534. He uh, persuades uh, the uh, parliament to pass an act of supremacy. Throughout this 100-year period, depending on which king you're talking about, there's going to be a lot of... Um, a lot of passing of acts of supremacy and acts of conformity. The acts of supremacy have to do with the king being the supreme head of the civil government and the church. And so when the parliament grants that to, um, to Henry VIII, now then, um, he, uh, that, that's the beginning, that's the, the beginning of the break from the church. Um, and uh, the, the um, inauguration or the birth of the, uh, of the English church. Um, again, here's a little bit uh, about, the, uh, about the history of, uh, uh, of uh, Henry VIII, and you can pick, you can pick this up um, you know, at various places. Even something like w Wikipedia would give you the broad, would give you the broad strokes. Um, I think what is interesting is that uh, going back to uh, going back to Tyndale uh, for a minute, um, there was such a um, an outcry against Tyndale on the part of uh, uh, the the leadership of the of the country that he was arrested in 1536. He was strangled uh, at the stake before he was burned, 
And then his last words were, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. That was his last words. Open the eyes of the King of England. So if you look on that, uh, uh, on that next section there, uh, there is a double asterisk there. Two years after uh, Tyndale's prayer, Lord, open the eyes of, king, of the king, Henry pronounces that no one should be discouraged from reading the Bible, but encouraged to read what is, in fact, the very word of God. Yeah. Um, I don't quite understand this second sentence here in that paragraph about Henry VIII, the third paragraph. According to Leviticus 20, 20, his marriage is illicit because he was childless and should be annulled. Right. That's Leviticus 20, 20, that prohibits adultery with your brother's wife. Right. He didn't commit adultery with his brother's wife. He married her after he died. Right. There's nothing prohibited by Leviticus for that. You read this, you read this uh, portion of history, and anybody who understands Leviticus 20, 20 um, says, this is no justification for a divorce. Uh, that's not what happened here. But nevertheless, this was the report that was brought back by a group of people, uh, theologians, that, um, that Henry VIII identified and said, give me a justification for uh, my, uh, uh, so that I can, I can present that to the Pope and I can get a divorce. But he wasn't childless either. He, he had a daughter. Oh, well, the daughter, that doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was essentially Childless because he didn't. This is not. All, this is not about having children. This is about having an heir. And so he will keep marrying until he gets a son. Just follow up one minute. I mean, Leviticus twenty says that the curse for an adultery is that both of them will be childless. He wasn't childless. Well, um, in, in Leviticus terms, um, and the terms of uh, the uh, uh, 16th century England, two different, two different understandings of that. It's, it's, it's generally understood that it's just the weakest of all places, but this is the only place they could find in the Bible that could in some way justify um, his getting a divorce. Now, there's, there's long, uh, long treatises to be read on how they, how they came about that. Uh, question. Did Huss have anything to do with this? I always pictured uh, Wycliffe to Huss to Luther to Tyndale. Did, was, was Huss in there as far as the, uh, you know, kind of a prelude to uh, period? Yeah, he, yeah, I, yeah he, was, he was part of that, uh, that prelude to the, to the Reformation as well. I chose these two because of the focus on the Bible. On the scripture. Yeah, on the scripture. He didn't, that's why I was wondering. Yeah. I can't remember. He didn't have a whole lot to do with uh, translations. Not translations and that kind of thing. No, Scott. Yeah. Bruce. Just in context, Henry wasn't an easygoing guy, so if these theologians didn't come up with a good answer... They were really? Asked, yeah. Literally. Give me an answer. <laughs> Any answer. <laughs> right. They were under a little bit of pressure. Yeah. Right. Right. Wasn't an easy going guy. Wasn't an easy going man. Um, with Bibles in hand, butchers and bakers demand to know where the priests get their Catholic ideas. With the Bible in the hands of the people, the Reformation in England could not be stopped. The power of the Word of God. This is our. This is our heritage. Okay. Henry dies. Edward becomes king at age nine. He, quote unquote, reigns for six years. And then he dies um, as well. There are, um, in, in all these um, uh, reigns of these kings, the ones that are opposed to Reformation, they're dealing with um, hangings and burnings at the stake and all of those kinds 
of things. If, on the other hand, there was a king who had uh, Reformation sensibilities, um, their, uh, their difficulty was to try to keep the country together. We'll see that with regard to uh, Queen Elizabeth and the so-called Elizabeth Settlement. She's got these individuals who are reading the Bible now. They're reading about uh, reading stuff written by Luther. Um, they are questioning the role, not only of the church, but they're questioning uh, authority, period. So they're beginning to question even the authority of the king. The king is beginning to feel very, very uncomfortable here. Um, and so um, there, there's always this attempt to try to cater to as many people as they possibly can. We'll see in just a minute here during the so-called uh, Elizabethan era and the Elizabethan settlement, there's at least four different groups of individuals who are, um, who are responding to the presence of the word of God and truth and joining them in this questioning about, uh, about how the church uh, is operating. You can see here uh, the clergy uh, are now allowed to marry. People receive, uh, uh, able to receive, uh, receive bread and the wine. Icons are removed from sanctuaries. Um, altars are replaced by the table, the Book of Common uh, Prayer and the 42 Articles of Religion are affirmed. Um, we then come to the period of uh, Bloody Mary, and this begins now to lay some groundwork for what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of weeks. The reforms under uh, Edward VI and Lady Jane Grey um, are reversed during the reign of Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, who reinstated the Latin Mass and enforced English allegiance to the Pope, accompanied by 270 Protestant martyrs, including uh, Thomas Cranmer. Many Protestants flee to Europe to escape persecution. This is going to be important because... Um, these individuals who are, seek, who are not only seeking safety, but a deeper spiritual experience, they're going to go to Europe. And where are they going to go? They're going to go to, among other places, Geneva. And when they get to Geneva, who are they going to listen to who's preaching in Geneva? Calvin. And so here, then, uh, is where, ultimately, Englishmen who have escaped to Europe because of Bloody Mary, they pick up not only Reformed theology, but a Reformed theology of church government as well. And so when they come back, we've got a group of, uh, of English, ultimately Puritans, who are Presbyterian in nature, and that Presbyterianism comes with them when they come to, uh, when they come to, the, to the New World. Um, but this, you know, this is a key. They were um, 800 or so Protestants who fled uh, to Europe uh, under Bloody uh, Mary. Uh, she reinstalls Catholic bishops. The Bibles are removed. Those Bibles that had been distributed, they're all uh, uh, gathered up. Some are burned vestiges of Roman Catholicism that had been removed under um, uh, um, Henry VIII and his, uh, and his son Edward, they are now reintroduced um, again. Um, the clergy who had been married were now separated from their wives. Vestments are required. The altar is, is returned so there's this big, uh, well, you think that there's upheaval in the church now, <laughs> you know. Uh, we went from sort of Catholic days to Protestant days to Catholic days to Protestant days, depending on who, who was the uh, king. 300 evangelicals are burned alive at the stake, and Protestants flee to Europe, and they are, in fact, received warmly by Calvin. 
and uh, others are distributing Reformation literature underground. Uh, the brutality of Mary is associated with Rome. Be people begin to question Catholic doctrines. Where does this stuff come from? Mary ultimately dies without an heir. She thinks she's pregnant by her husband, uh, Philip of Spain, but in actuality, she has stomach cancer and, uh, and she dies. When she dies, the word gets around, now we can go back home. We can go back home to England, those who have fled to Europe. And so they start coming back. And when they come back, they are very, very disappointed because the great preaching that they had in Geneva um, and the uh, whole reformed ethos, including church government and all those kinds of things, is something that they loved, they, they uh, luxuriated in when they were in Europe and they came back to England and they said, no, what in the world, what in the world is this? So when they come back, there are at least four groups of individuals. This is why, so it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of all this. Four groups who come back from Europe or those who are within the Reformed uh, way of thinking in the Church of England. Um, I, I get a kick out of reading this because it sounds very familiar to me. First of all, there were those who seek mild reforms. And so let's just get rid of the vestments and let's emphasize preaching. That's the way the church will be reformed in England. That was one group. A second group, they said what we need to do is we need to change the structure of church power. Uh, this business of the, of the, of the pope who's in, uh, and, then, and bishops and councils and this top-down authority thing for the church, that's not what it's all about. When we were in Geneva, we sat together you know, as equals. We heard the word of God preached. It was a wonderful thing. We come back here, and you've got all this uh, power and authority vested in individuals up at the top, uh, and this is, uh, this is no good. A third group said that they would essentially withdraw in place. I get a kick out of this because this was one of the, uh, this was one of the uh, approaches that was promoted by many at the time uh, that we were considering leaving the PCUSA. And there were many individuals who followed that. And practically speaking, that's kind of what we did here. We withdrew in place. So in other words, they just stopped opening the mail from the presbytery, you know, didn't pay the per capita, and became congregational. The broad um, category for that group of individuals would be called nonconformists. So they're not going to conform to the way in which the church has been structured, which depending on who's the king, what time in history it is, maybe a little more Catholic, a little less Catholic, maybe very, very Catholic. So there were those nonconformists who said, we're just gonna, we're just not gonna take uh, any phone calls from anybody in the church office, you know? And so they became independent congregations or nonconformists. Then there were those who said, we cannot in good conscience stay in the church. And they became known as separatists. Okay. So the nonconformists ultimately became identified as just pilgrims, uh, uh, Puritans. But those who said, we have got to withdraw from, we just in good conscience cannot wear the Church of England t-shirt anymore. Um, and uh, they were the ones who ultimately became the pilgrims. Okay? And things get so bad for them that, um, that they escape to Holland 
And that's why we have in our, you know, uh, in uh, a very laconic study of, uh, of American history, we've got, uh, we, we know that generally some of these people who came to, the, to Massachusetts, uh, they came from Holland. What in the world was that all about? Well, the, those were the separatists. So next week, we'll look at the separatists and the pilgrims. The following week, we'll look at the nonconformists and, uh, and the Puritans. I know this is just very, 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 very complicated and convoluted. That's why I tried to put some things down here on, um, on, on paper for you. Um, and I think that we're probably, <coughs> we're probably out of time here. I wanna, just want to see if there's anything else I wanted to underscore. I don't think so. You can, um, <clears throat> you can um, uh, read some of this on your own. I guess the other thing is this, uh, this whole idea of these four existing groups within the church, um, this is um, Elizabeth's way of, uh, of trying to maintain unity. Uh, this is what was referred to as the via media sort of the middle, the middle way. Um, in our own denomination 20 years ago, there was the approach, there was a, those who were seeking, quote, common ground. Same kind of, same kind of thing. Um, and in fact, from time to time, one of the ways that uh, some of us who were a part of a group of people who were moving away from the denomination were cursed <laughs> was to be called be called separatists or um, or pilgrims. Um, I'm not a pilgrim. I didn't have the hat. Uh, so uh, you can take a look at the take a look at the rest of that. Um, I just wanted to kind of give us a running a running start because it's right here <clears throat> when um, um, after Elizabeth when we get into the. Um, uh, the reign of, of, of James I, who comes from Scotland because um, uh, Mary uh, Elizabeth has no children. Uh, they've got to find somebody to be the king. So they go uh, to Scotland uh, to a cousin, and, uh, and uh, James then becomes, uh, becomes the king not only of England, but Scotland and Ireland as well. As the notes indicate, this is the introduction of the term Great Britain at this particular point in time. Yeah, so. so I apologize for a lot of this confusion, but uh, there's some things on, on paper there, and we'll be getting back to it for sure in the weeks that are ahead. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this glorious history, and we know that uh, some of it's not very glorious at all, uh, that uh, your heart is broken over the brokenness of your church. But we thank you that you have raised up individuals who remain faithful to your word. And not only the word that's printed in the Bible, but the, your very word that comes from your heart, from your mouth to us. Make us, Lord, faithful to that word, we pray. Um, help us never to uh, turn our backs on it, but to, uh, to read it, study it, preach it, hear it, defend it, live by it. For your praise and glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.